the vice chancellor, the mayor, the provost, our esteemed staff, and um, most valued students. Welcome to the Bolton Leadership Conference, where we're gathered today to have a deep dive into the world of leadership. And I'm thrilled to have each one of you join us in this journey. First off, I want to say um, a round of applause. I would like us to give a round of applause to the University of Bolton for its recent achievements being recognized among the top 30 universities by The Guardian and earning a silver rating in the Teaching Excellence Framework, TEF. That's no small feat. A round of applause once more. Thank you so much. Kudos to the entire team, staff and students, and especially to our Vice Chancellor, Professor George E. Holmes for that incredible feat for leading the way. Leadership is the backbone of progress. It's what drives positive change in communities, businesses, and institutions. There's a lot to talk about mentoring in leadership, and for good reason, mentoring resonates deeply in many cultures. It is also seen as a key motivational strategy in education, enhancing performance and quality. Today, our conference aims to highlight the importance of mentoring in leadership, emphasizing how current leaders can shape the next generation. I'm excited to introduce to you our panelists for today. They are not just experts in their fields, but have also showcased outstanding leadership throughout their careers. Their stories are bound to inspire and enlighten us. But today isn't about listening. It's about engaging. It's about discussion and sharing. Our dialogue session promises to be a highlight with carefully chosen questions that touch on the many aspects of leadership. With such a diverse audience, I'm sure the discussions will be insightful and enriching. Remember, today is about active participation. It's a chance for all of us to reflect, share, and grow. The knowledge we gain today can shape our future leadership roles and our impact on the global stage. So let's dive in, learn from each other, and commit to making a difference. Let's embark on this enlightening journey together. Thank you so much. I would like to call on our guest speakers to please rise and take up the stage. Professor George Holmes, our mayor, Dr. Rehan Hazan, Professor Zuber, Ms. Camilla, Andrew Roberts. And then for academic panelists, I'd like to call on Dr. Chatrika, Dr. Rashid Bello, Mr. Ifan. And then Dr. Ankal Gad. And then for our moderators, I'd like to call on our chief moderator, Dr. Ewen De Celestine. Dr. Sam Johnson. Bolua Tife Oyeshola. Ansh. Nehit Tiwari and Charlotte Shears. A round of applause once more. I would like to invite uh, the President and Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor George Holmes, for his presidential address.
Well, good evening. And they say uh, no pressure, don't they? A presidential uh, address. That's quite, uh, quite alarming, really. Uh, I can assure you that I'm neither President of the United States or any other part of the world, but I am actually uh, the head of this university and have the privilege of having that uh, role for uh, the last 18 years. Um, remarkable that may seem, my incredible youth. But, uh, are you awake out there? How are you awake? Yeah. Um, Leadership is the topic uh, this evening, and as the student president pointed out, it's about engaging and sharing practice and sharing views with others. And so I'm here as much to listen as I am to speak. I'm here to learn, I'm here to develop, because as we all know, life is a learning and developmental journey. If someone tells you they know it, they're probably either misguided or wrong. So the first key point I want to make about any form of leadership is that the, the listening is as important as the speaking. And so from my point of view, it's important tonight that we all listen to each other, share views, share opinions, and learn from each other. My leadership journey has been uh, long, tortuous, complex, and at times downright worrying. Uh, it has, uh, however, been fulfilling, enjoyable, creative, and indeed fulfilled a lifelong ambition for me to do the things I wanted to do to help and support people to develop further. You join a university to head a university to develop people and their potential for the future. I happen to believe in limitless human potential. I happen to believe, in, as Hawking, I think, said, we're limited only by our imagination. And our imagination is where, it, this is the place where imagination takes flight in a university, where you can think the things that you perhaps haven't thought before, where you can look at things in a different way, where you can take a different perspective on the world and be challenged and be re rewarded and recognized for those alternative perspectives. There's never one right answer, except as Zubair will point out in certain parts of mathematics. <laughs> but for us, our social scientists, I'm an economist by training, there's never a right answer, there's just a series of perceptions on an answer that will give you a close approximation to your truth, your own truth. Um, and of course, that will differ for each and every one of us. So leadership should be about a listening, engaging, passionate, visionary, compelling journey that takes you to the destination that you want to reach, that allows you to achieve the potential you wish to achieve, but perhaps more importantly allows you to bring along with you the potential achievement of others. Because what is life about, other than mobile phones, what is life about <laughs> if it's not about helping others to achieve their human potential? We've, we've been put here for a reason, who knows why, I think it's because we're here to help others achieve the things they want to achieve in life. And you will often, through that, achieve things you wouldn't imagine were possible. And in that sense, that's what my leadership journey has been about, and what I hope your leadership journey is about, in terms of achieving your own potential by helping others to see and achieve their own potential. In leading this university for the last 18 years, I thought I'd make some observations about that in this particular address and about the concept which was coined by a professor of University College Los Angeles, UCLA, when he talked about, Burton Clark talked about willful institution building, that leaders of successful modern organizations should be involved in this sector in the willful building of a sustainable institution, which is neither accidental nor incidental, but willful in its focus on the objective. In this case, maximizing student satisfaction to ensure that students get the very best out of their opportunity here in this university. And we've had quite a journey in respect to that willful institution building to willfully sustain improvements in our student experience. The last seven national student surveys in this country have illustrated that we are the highest ranking modern university Indeed, they're the highest ranking university in the northwest of England for our student satisfaction for a number of years running now. And that's because of our focus, the, colleagues, the focus of my colleagues, 
on your experience if you're a student here at this university, on ensuring that you get the best possible opportunities. And we're, we're lucky to have a student union president and a student union here who are equally well respected by the student body for giving people opportunities to expand their potential. And so you have a combined leadership journey here between the student president, the student officers, and the student union itself, and the university itself, where I have several hundred, indeed 2,000 colleagues who are working here in this university and its wider group, the college, and our supported uh, subsidiaries, to give you the best possible opportunity available. So I'd summarize, if I will, because it's a short to address this, but I'll summarize by saying leadership's about having an open mind, about listening to others, about creating opportunities for others, about recognizing you can do nothing on your own in this world, absolutely nothing on your own in this world. When you come into this world, you don't come into it on your own, you come into it with a mother. You're not on your own. And in that sense, as you come through that journey, you can't achieve anything without other people alongside you. And in leadership, if they're not aligned with your vision, you've got the wrong vision because you'll achieve nothing in the world without the people being aligned to what it is you're trying to achieve. And so in this willful institution building journey, we've been fortunate here that we have a group of like-minded people, almost 2,000 of them on the staff of the organization, who are committed to the widest possible opportunity, the widest possible access and inclusion, the most diverse and culturally rich organization that will give people a chance to be world citizens and recognize that in that leadership journey for the world, none of us are on our own, none of us are in isolation, and all our actions impact on others. And so my observations to you would be leadership, handle with care, handle with pride, and handle with inclusion, and you can't go far wrong. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to invite Dr. Rehan Hazan for your opening address. Thank you. A round of applause, please. Hello, everyone. Oh, can you hear me okay? Um, I haven't got a, a scripted address. In fact, I only found out I was doing this about two hours ago. So, uh, so bear with me if I ramble on. And I think that's part of the test of being a leader. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you, George. Thank you for the university for, for the opportunity. Um, I, think it's, um, I think you've gone through a fantastic journey and it's clearly through the leadership of George and sustained and continuity of thought uh, and action that's allowed the University of Bolton to progress so much. Um, I think it is amazing, as you said. Number 30 in the Guardian rankings, I would never have believed that when I went to university that, that Bolton would be up there. So congratulations to you. And, and we'll give him a, a hand again. So um, leadership. I, I'm, a, I'm a local boy, uh, not far from here. Um, uh, I was born. Uh, I never thought of myself as a leader, never thought of myself as a, a career person, never thought of myself as a businessman. Um, and you sort of stumble through life. Um, I didn't know whether I wanted to be an engineer or a lawyer, um, and ended up something in the middle, uh, and is still hard to describe. But I ended up becoming the CEO for a company called Ericsson, looking after Middle East and Africa, um, looking after 2,000 employees uh, across 24 countries, and 11,000 indirect employees as well. I retired seven years ago, started my own business, and then sold that to the government of Malaysia, uh, and went through the honor of working with some great visionary leaders, being the leader, perhaps a bad one to many people, and having many leaders work for me as well. So, you know, this is a subject that's, that's very exciting for me and, and has a lot of meaning because you don't, nobody really starts off to be a leader, do they? You, you're not born saying, I want to be a leader. Everybody wants to be a fireman or a, a policeman. Um, leadership are qualities that grow uh, and, and are nurtured. I remember right at the beginning of my career, 
um, I talked to my first manager, and he probably gave me the best advice of all. I asked him, what is leadership or what is management? And he said, everybody's a leader, Rahan. Everybody's a leader. And I said, really? He said, yeah. The first and most important thing you have to lead is yourself. Everybody's a leader of themselves. Everything else comes secondary. Lead yourself in a way that you would be proud of. That's what he said. Everything else will work. And those words rang very true. You know, um, you try and aspire to be the best pers possible person you can at work with the way you deal with others, with compassion and empathy. Try to understand the business and do right by your employer. And you'll get promoted really quickly because a lot of other people aren't doing that. They're very selfish. The moment you start thinking about the, the things around you, you'll find that leadership comes naturally. People gravitate towards you. People want to understand what you can offer and ask for your help. And as long as you're there just to help people, then you become a leader very, very quickly. So, um, you know, as part of this journey uh, that I've been through, I've realized there is no such thing as a stereotypical leader. We all think of, you know, and I think you mentioned it, presidents of countries as being leaders. Well, they haven't set very good examples recently, if I think of the ones that I can think of, either prime ministers or presidents. Um, and, you know, I think those are bad role models. Leaders for me, are, there's much better leaders, and I, I won't go in, I won't use this opportunity to go into that. But leadership is something that, you know, the only thing I will say is it comes from within. Be true to yourself, be honest. It doesn't, you don't have to agree with everybody. You don't have to think about whether they're going to like what, you, or you, what you're going to say. The best leader is one that can stand by what they, what they, what they believe in. Um, that's key. Recently, um, and actually with Zubair, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, you might remember we went with Sheikh Saud in Ras al Khaimah, and we talked about leadership, and we were talking about European leadership. And he said, you know, they're all compromised. They're all too worried about what people will think. They're all too worried, and they don't say what they really believe in. They're not willing to act on their beliefs. And he said, a leader shouldn't be that. People elect a leader to do what he thinks is right. So whether you're elected or unelected is, is secondary in this. And then he gave us an example and he said, other than perhaps prophets and people of great religious uh, importance, God realizes everybody's a sinner. Your route to heaven isn't to avoid sin. Don't try and be perfect. Just be true to yourself and just try and do more good then you do evil. And in the same way for a leader, I think uh, we shouldn't try and be perfect. I don't think there is that. Do what you believe is right. Right for you, right for the people around you, right for the organization, and you'll climb very far in your career. So that's my journey on leadership. I think George is doing a fantastic job with leadership of this organization. It's climbing the ranks. Uh, I think I've lost a few bets already. I hope I lose a few more. But it's a, a pleasure to be part and, uh, and be part of this association and institution. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rehan, for that um, wonderful speech. So um, we're going to have the dialogue session take place now. Um, but before that, I want you to see this as an opportunity to get inspired. Some students have come to ask me, um, what you intend to achieve through this. Um, we cannot undermine the fact that the burden or the role of mentoring and creating future leaders lies on current leaders. So behind me, I have a team of experts who have a lot they want to share with us. Get inspired by this dialogue session, challenge yourself, and in the course of this session, if you have any question you want to ask, Please write it down and hand over your sheets to Asma. Asma, can you please raise your hand here? Please hand over your sheets, your questions to Asma, and um, we'll get it sorted out at the end of the dialogue session. So may I call on Dr. Celestine Iwendi to please take charge of the oh. dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. I have to remove my suit because it's, this is a serious matter. <laughs> we are ready to fight. You know, I told my student when I visited uh, India in January as a visiting professor to VIT that I'm going to create a novelty 
the, you know, George always says, create a novelty anywhere you go. So I turned tikka masala to masala tikka. And uh, the food was quite delicious. So we are back to leadership. And this question is to uh, the vice chancellor. And I have questions also for our special guest. In an environment of constant flaws. Now, my dad always says, if you want to know anything about leadership, go and get married. <laughs> and I was like, OK. When I got married, the first question was, how do we spend the money? And then my dad told me, he said, you will learn in marriage that your money is our money, and our money is our money. <laughs> and I'm like, OK. He said, if you don't want trouble, let our money be her money, and your money be her money. And I'm like, it's not fair. Is leadership fair? We will come to know about that later on. So, Mr. Uh, Vice Chancellor, sir, in an environment of constant flaws, how do you approach change management in an organization? It can also be in a career setting. And what advice do you have to give to us? either in the place of leadership, you know, and uh, there's something you told me, but it's not for public. <laughs> we can come that, to that later in terms of AI. But sir, how do you see this in an environment of constant flaws? Thank you. Thank you. Very wise words uh, there. Um, I think the first issue is um, danger or warning, constant flux in process. Okay, so weather warning, constant change, constant flux. It's almost been a, uh, um, a motif of my life, if you like, in that um, every year someone said to me, whether it be at school or whether it be at university or whether it be in work, that this is a year of big change. Yeah, this is the biggest change we've seen so far. Uh, this is gonna be seismic. Uh, this is gonna be different. Uh, this is going to be something that will uh, make us operate in a different manner. And here we are. Um, I'll say I'm 38 years old. Um, <laughs> several years later, uh, going through that same flux. So the first issue I'd have for leadership would be careful what you believe. Is what you're being told what is actually happening? And is what they're saying is actually going to happen, going to happen? So be very careful in a time uh, of flux. And analysis, uh, I would say this as an economist, analysis is always important in any circumstances. Um, and triangulation, perhaps even more important. What is happening is what they say is happening, actually happening. Does everyone agree that that's what's happening? Is that the direction it's going? Are those changes consistent or are those external flux is contradictory. What is it you're getting in that leadership dashboard? I'm a big believer, um, people who come to um, sessions with me on different things will, will recognize I, I constantly describe leading a large organization as, as flying an A380 um, jet. And they are sitting on the flight deck and uh, I would always describe it as people sitting behind you, you've got various technical experts, navigators, technical flight engineers, and then you have the first class passengers, the business class passengers, those in economy, and then you have the, the steerage luggage, etc., in the plane, and you're responsible for this, this flight as you're heading uh, across wherever it is you're heading to. And one of the big issues in terms of that constant flux or change in the environment that you're flying through is um, what are the external sources telling you about it, but also what are all your dials telling you on your dashboard or on your instrument panel? What's it saying about the level of energy you've got left in terms of the fuel you have in your tank? What's it saying about your altitude? What's it saying about your expertise to deal with the issue? What's it saying about what's going on elsewhere on your particular map as you transport your organization or yourself through your life journey through this constant flux? And being analytically aware is critically important. But that's not to say to be paralyzed by analysis. That's often been said in universities that we are paralyzed by analysis or paralysis by analysis. So don't be paralyzed by it, but certainly be aware, acutely aware, and triangulate the information you're getting. If you then do make a decision 
and that can be a very difficult and tortuous process as to making any changes in that flux, then you may then have to stick with that decision through difficult times. And that becomes even more problematic because there's the famous performance dip curve where you make a change in whatever flux environment you're in. Performance in whatever form, human performance, organizational performance, external performance, can dip. And often people then panic and change again at that point. And there's a case in point right now in British higher education that we were, we were discussing just before we came in into this, uh, into this event about these organizations last hundreds if not thousands of years, but the environment is in constant flux. During the time this university has existed as a, an institute of education, we've had two world wars, we've had two global pandemics, we've had the Great Depression, we've had a number of recessions, we've had leadership who could be described as outstanding, we've had leadership who could be described as appalling, and yet the organization has survived through that period of time. And so a leader should never forget in a time of constant flux that if they're a sustainable organization, depending on the type of organization they are, that making too many changes may not be the smartest move. So to attempt to answer the examination question in a hope to get at least a 2-1 here in terms of relation to this, in an environment of constant flux, well, that's what we're in, how do you approach change management? With great caution particularly in terms of both organization and career settings. There's a real connection between the organization and if you're the CEO, the career setting. Get this wrong and you soon find yourself on the bench somewhere else, you've gone. And so you, you handle with great care. The advice I've given to other individuals is you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listen to what people are saying to you before you say something, particularly if you're a leader. Thank you. My mentor will say, the mouth is created to talk. If it doesn't talk, it smells. <laughs> so sometimes we need to talk to define the truth. Like you know. So I, I have a question for Dr. Rehan. You have been a CEO of uh, Ericsson. That is uh, commendable. And uh, you are in here to give us something that will help us. Uh, we know quite well, like what the Vice Chancellor said, when a leader tells a lie, it takes another lie to protect the first lie. And that is exactly a summary of what I got from his statement. You know, and it keeps going on. And it keeps being magnified by the media. So sometimes we ask the question, what is the truth? And until we know the truth, we cannot be set free. So let's go back, sir, Dr. Rehan. What do you have to say in the environment of Ericsson most of our students are going to work in those areas or bigger places, IBM and others. What do you have to say as advice to our students and our colleagues? Thank you. Thank you. Um, look, uh, I, th I think it's a, a little bit about perspective as well. Um, George and I were discussing just before this that there's the, the UK university sort of world <laughs> is completely different from the commercial environment that perhaps I've come from. Uh, in our environment, you snooze, you lose. You're probably going to be a leader of an organization for a few years. Your company, if lucky, I think we, we talked about 12 companies that have lasted more than 100 years in, in, in the top echelons of, of um, UK society. Whereas UK universities, some of them have been here over a thousand years, and probably uh, George as well. Uh, you know, he probably sees both. <laughs> <laughs> not, not you personally. George as well sees Bolton uh, under a much longer perspective than his 38 years uh, of youth. Like, yes. Okay. 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 Um, so, so I think I think um, coming back to um, you know how do I differ in my view? Um, change for sure is around us. Sometimes you have to react very quickly, and in some environments, you have to be much more measured uh, and, and take a, a longer term and deliberate view. I, I, can reflect on, I can reflect on one discussion that happened between, and I think it was about 12 years ago, I, th I think you guys have heard this story, between the vice chairman of the Communist Party in China and the American ambassador to China at the time. And um, 
we were on a round table a bit like this and somebody asked us, um, what do you think of um, the French Revolution? I don't know when it was, you, you, you have any idea, 150, 200, 200, 300 years ago? And, uh, 1783, 1780, I'm not sure. Um, the American ambassador very quickly said, uh, you know, it's great, it was about liberation, it was about, you know, the, the power to the people and overthrow of um, authoritarian regimes and about democracy. Um, all, all worthwhile uh, insights. The vice chairman of the Chinese party said, I think it's too early to say. This is an incident that happened 300 years ago. He said, it might be good now, we'll find out the real implication of this in another thousand years. So it comes back to perspective. 1789, he got it right, he got it right. Um, um, so, so I think it comes back to perspective. In um, You asked what would it be for you like in a, in a commercial setting there are obviously some institutions that are, uh, are longer standing and have longer perspectives than you have. There are some that are very short term that will expect you to make quick decisions uh, and, and show rapid response. The only feedback I would have is that I think that uh, it comes down to one, one common trait that I think leaders have is flexibility and adaptability. You've got to be open. 90% of people, if you ask them about change, will say, Yes, I embrace change, but the reality is 90% of people resist it. Uh, I think that's you know, a, a commonly quoted statistic, but I found it very true. Normally, it's the people that m are most welcoming of change are the ones that are most resistant. They'll say, yeah, yeah, we need to change, but not my department. His department and his department, there's something wrong with everybody else. That's a, a, a corporate inertia that, that comes. Be open to it be embracing of it, consider it, and then as George said, you can decide uh, when you've had some time to think about things, whether, whether it applies or not. So that would be my feedback on, on that corporate flux and, uh, and change around us. Okay. Yeah. I think we have the academic panelists now in their own view. Don't be scared that the, the elephants in the house have spoken, <laughs> you know. Someone said, Celestine, you are an ant. I said, yes, the ant carries sugar. So if you see yourself as an ant, you are the one that bears the sugar that we're looking for. So panelists, I want to call Dr. Katarika to give us your view. Like Dr. Rehan has said, leadership has to be perspective, what you are thinking. So I don't know if you have a different idea or academic idea that would lead you to next journal paper. So let's hear from Dr. Katarika. Thank you, Celestine. Uh, I think I'll go to my training. So um, I have two roots uh, in my career. One is as a clinician, I've learned to be very reflective. So that's one of the skills I always say use that. Um, and then the other side is me being a researcher and being the critical evaluator. So I use those two, and I think most of our students are trained to do this, and this is, that's one of the, uh, two of the skills I always embrace using when in the flux of change. And, uh, yeah, the, the constant flux. And then I would go back to the the conversation, just to add on to what has been um, discussed here, the adaptability and flexibility. Uh, in the constant flux, one of the other uh, skills that I use, the adaptability and flexibility skills, particularly developing the tacit knowledge uh, within an organization, because we do document quite a lot, but the tacit knowledge that has actually given me more depth and breadth of knowledge and skill set to um, constantly adjust and change uh, in a changing environment. So that's my view from a more researcher and a clinician point of view. Okay. Thank you. Can you please put a good clap for her? We have the last person to answer this question. 
Dr. Rashid Bello. Um, is coming from the managerial side, you know, to give us a view on what leaders need to do, and maybe from your own experience. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I will start by saying that to manage change effectively, you need to be a good leader. You must have that leadership skills in you. Everybody is born to be a leader, just like the speaker have said. But for you to be an effective leader, according to Dr. Inwendi, you need to get married first. <laughs> when you marry, you know what leadership is all about. I will take this from the academic point of view. We in academics, we believe in theories. We believe in literature. There are a lot of leadership or change management model that we can adopt in this type of situation. We have um, Lewis change model, which you can adopt. We have Cotter's eight steps model, which you can adopt. We also have bridge transition model and so on and so forth. But to cut it short, for you to manage change effectively, there are some steps that we need to follow. The first step is to assess and plan. You start by thorough assessing the need for change. You need to identify the goals and the objective of the change, and also what are the potential risks and the people and the process that is going to be affected. The second step is to engage the stakeholders. When you talk about the stakeholders, you need to communicate with the key stakeholders, which include your employees, customers, management. You need to involve them in everything about the change. And one important aspect is a clear communication. You need to be transparent and consistent. Communication is very essential. You need to let them know and address their fear about the need for change. Also, you need to appoint change champion or leaders within the organization who can promote the change and help others to understand and adopt the change. Training and skill development is another aspect. When change happens, people will definitely resist change. We need to train your employees on the skills needed for them to fit in perfectly into the change. And also, establish mechanism for gathering feedback and monitoring progress when the change is eventually implemented. I will stop there for now and provide advice for the youth. I'm also one of the youth as well. In terms of the youth, what advice will I give you? Change will always occur. You need to embrace change. This change we are talking about is inevitable in both our personal life and our professional life. One more thing that is very important is continuous learning. Invest in your education. We are all here to learn. When you invest in education and personal development, you'll be able to understand a lot about the aspect of life. Another advice I'll give you is you need to be resilient. Develop resilience to cope with the setbacks. There will always be a setback. Things will get rough along the line. If things get rough, how will you get out of it? You need to develop that resilience skills. Networking is another area. Don't limit yourself to your colleagues alone. Network with other professions as well so that you can learn more about what they do. And also stay informed 
about global trends, economic shifts, technological advancement. Being aware of the bigger picture can help you anticipate and adapt to change. Also, we don't need to be rigid. Adaptability is very important. Cultivate adaptability by seeking out new experiences, taking on diverse challenges, and being open to different perspectives. You also need to set clear goals for yourself. If you are a leader and you don't have a vision, you are not yet a leader. Set a clear goal. In academics, we always say your goal needs to be smart, specific, measurable, achievable, and what? Realistic. Thank you very much. And time bound. Give yourself the time as well. Also, self reflection. You need to reflect about where you are, where are you going, and what are the things that you need to do to improve. And also, lastly, mental and physical well-being. Take care of your physical and mental health. It's very, very important. A healthy body and mind are better equipped to handle change and challenges. And lastly, seek mentorship. This is very important. Find a mentor who can offer guidance and support. They can provide valuable insight based on their own experience. As we are gathering here today, listening to people from the industry, listening to the vice chancellors, we can tap one or two things from their experience. Thank you very much. All right. Celestine. Good evening, everyone. Okay, I'm going to stand here, giving directions here. Thank you, everyone, for attending this evening, a fantastic evening. Um, I've got a couple of questions uh, for some of our honoured guests. But first of all, if I could ask, please, Mr. Mayor, if you'd be happy to answer a question for me. Um, would you be happy to pinpoint for us a time in your life where you were pursuing a dream and suddenly felt that it was unattainable? Oh, no, it's an unattainable dream. But you persevered and you worked through your personal doubts. Could you share with us you know, some things that we could learn from that, please? That'd be so helpful. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, I am actually not uh, intellectual as this panelist here. My answer will not be very long, lengthy one. Uh, I believe actually in the positive thinking. I believe, don't believe in the negative. I always think about positive and work hard. Uh, especially I, when I entered into the politics, I fought the first election in 2004, which I lost by about 1,800 uh, votes. But that didn't uh, put me off. So since 2006, thank you. Since 2006, I was selected and elected in 2006. Ever since, I have been the councillor for up to now, 23, and I got mayor now, ship now. So all I want to say is that what I learned in my life that always think positive, don't think negative, and work hard. You'll achieve your goals. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. And I'd like to ask the same question of uh, Professor Hanslot. Um, Zubair and I have worked together for many, many years, and he's a very dynamic and visionary individual. So I'm sure, Professor, you will have had moments in time where you have been pursuing a dream and thought, goodness me, is this actually achievable? Could you tell us about one of those moments, please? Uh, thanks, Sam. I think you're very kind. And uh, likewise, I think Sam and I have enjoyed many years working together in a, in a very, very brilliant way. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> times when I f have felt my dreams can't be achieved. I think the, the one time I would go back to is uh, back to school days. I, like a lot of probably students who come to universities like this, I went to a school where it was quite challenging for somebody like me in, in the sense that people learn in a different way. People 
accept things in a different way. Not that I was a troublemaker or anything, in the sense that I was told at one point that you will never get to a university. And I felt my dreams did shatter at that moment. And for a, you know, a good number of weeks, I guess, uh, I, I had self-doubt in myself to say, I don't think I, I can achieve this. I want to go to university. Uh, I'm probably not capable. Uh, the school feels um, I'm not able to do this. So they must be right. So th that was a moment, but I think ever since that moment, the good thing is, I think I had a very good family around me, and that really helped. And I think even whatever you do, family is very important in the sense that you, although we are individuals in this world, you, as, as, as Professor Holmes says, you come with your mother, your mother brings you into this world, so you do have someone. And I think that my family at the time when I was a child, this is going back where, you know, some time ago, age 14, um, where I felt my dreams have shattered because I want to get to university, but the school felt it's not for me. But my family thought otherwise. And in a way, my, I remember my dad clearly today saying to me, don't listen to them. You know, don't listen to what they're saying. Believe in yourself, work hard, do what you want to do, and you will get there. And I've always had a love for maths, and I've always wanted to do something in maths, and I felt well, I wanted to get to university to read mathematics and do things as I wanted to do. And it, it happened, but I, I guess there was that moment, but I think ever since that day, I've not let things, you know, I've not felt as though, um, obviously certain dreams are, you know, are unattainable. And you've got to be realistic in your goal. And as a person, I feel I'm, I'm reasonably realistic and grounded. Sometimes I, <laughs> I think in a dynamic way. I think way beyond, I guess, uh, what some people would expect of my talents. But it's, uh, it's good to dream that. But really be realistic in what you will expect. But don't let people hold you back. I think that's, that's quite important in the sense that you know, not everybody can see your potential, okay? And, um, you know, there's always some opportunity. Pursue that opportunity and realize your dream. Don't, don't feel, if somebody says you can't achieve this, that's the, the door closed forever. There'll be other doors that will open, and uh, I'm very proud to have worked here. I'm very, very proud to have experienced the university. But I also feel sad for the many people who are very, very capable, but yet can't get to university. And I think as, uh, as the Vice Chancellor said, it is, um, you know, it's up to us to help people. And I guess that's why uh, I came into teaching and that's why I stuck this out. Uh, so so that's, that's my answer. I'm not sure whether that's what you're looking for, Sam, but that's, that's my personal question. Fantastic, thank you very much. Very, very wise words from our provost there. So over to our academic panelists, and it's a similar question, really. So, Irfan, did you have a dream that you were pursuing in your life that you really wanted to achieve, and it was becoming too much of a struggle for you? Rather than giving up, what did you do? Could you share some of your experience and some of your handy tips with us, please? Thank you. Good evening to everybody, and thank you so much, to, by the way, to see all our students come here today. Um, and thank you panel members as well. Um, a couple of things, first of all, from myself, very, very importantly, in terms of failure. Failure itself is common, and you probably fail in either small terms or large terms every single day. In terms of my job, my normal work life, personal life, failure is common. I, computer not starting, battery on the phone going flat, car not starting, something going wrong. That is common. What do you do about that is very, very important. And how you handle yourself, that is the difference between a normal, common person and a leader in terms of business. Failure 
it's okay to fail and understanding that is very very important it could be anything failure is and will be part and parcel of life and that's the first thing that you need to understand and get over the barrier of that in terms of personal experience very very importantly um, and I can share something very similar to Zuba in terms of I was where you sat as a student and I actually applied here uh, to become a, a lecturer myself and I one of the lecturers asked what would you want to do I found and I went I want to teach like you're teaching this is my passion I love talking by the way so you might have to stop me halfway <laughs> so and I went, that's one of my passions. I love talking, I'm very inspirational. I like doing what I do. How do I get into teaching? And we eventually started making a plan and I applied and I failed first time. In fact, I failed a second time. And I said to one of the lecturers at the time, and I went, what do I do? And one of the skills I definitely learned was resilience, but more importantly, keep trying different avenues. What do you pick up on the way? What do you do something differently? So I did a risk management. Risk management of applying for a job. And that was very, very important. That I approached some senior members of staff. And I think that didn't go down well. Um, I approached them in the wrong way. So I went back to the drawing board. And I did one by one. I went of risk managing. What would the most appropriate be? I even contemplated contacting George at one stage. And I thought that might be a bit out of perspective. Um, so one by one, I looked at it and I went, right, let's do a risk management of applying. What would the best action be? Sitting down with my tutors, I planned a way in a way which would eventually get me into working in what I like doing. And it wasn't about the fact that I could apply anywhere else. It was about the fact that I wanted to apply to this university, and which kind of went into with my philosophy and my ethos an understanding of the community where I was born and that was very very important to me so because of that it was important that I keep going and making sure I come to that dream and making sure I do end up working here now you'll be thinking oh, how did he end up here in terms of getting to the final point it was very very important that it took not once not twice but the third time of trying and asking actually working, talking to the right people, as you said, resilience, um, as Dr. Bello said, resilience, networking, doing the right things, but also having a plan of action of doing it properly. And that was very, very important. It wasn't by chance. Sometimes you get lucky, but understanding failure is part and parcel and you keep persevering to keep going and keep going and doing it a different way. Don't keep doing the same thing over and over again in teaching as Chukarita said that reflective practice is important every day is a reflection if you keep walking down the stairs and keep falling surely you're going to take a different course of action in the same way if you fail try a different be adaptable be open to change that's all from me thank you so much Irfan and finally, um, for my question, could I ask uh, my dear colleague, Dr. Anshul, um, have you ever faced a challenge that you, you really felt was too much for you, that whilst you wanted to achieve that particular vision, that the hurdles just seemed to get higher and higher, but somehow you overcame them? Could you give us some information, some, some, some knowledge from your experience, Anshul? Uh, yes, we all face challenges, and every day there is a new challenge. Uh, I can just give some uh, a challenge which relates to the students like I wanted to do my PhD but there were so many personal and professional struggles and uh, I was doing my PhD under the vice chancellor so everyone in her office and anyone who visited her office would just push me down saying oh what a mistake you have done she's so busy she's so strict you will never be able to make up and uh, many of the people have just quit quitted and see, uh, we promised that in two or three months you will just run away. But I kept, uh, so my, uh, my three key words are believe in yourself and keep on working hard with dedication, passion, and just don't run away. There are no shortcuts in life. 
and you have to struggle and but you have to believe in yourself and work hard all the way and you will achieve what you want to achieve so there are two ways either you just run away from the challenge or you embrace it so i will just suggest that embrace the challenge and then uh, fighting the challenges will become a habit Thank you so much, Anshul, and to all the other speakers who've answered my questions so fulsomely and so interestingly. So I'm now going to hand over to Bolu, who's going to ask another question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bebo. So um, my question, I'm not married, by the way, uh, so I don't, I don't think that qualifies me for knowing anything about leadership now, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Uwede. But my question is to uh, our dear Professor George. Um, based on your professional perspective, which I know you have tons of, at just a young age of 38, wow, uh, what mentoring strategies can leaders employ in helping talented individuals overcome challenges and um, I mean, I think when you're dealing with uh, mentoring and supporting individuals, sort of um, three C's come to mind, really, in terms of the, um, the, the critical thing uh, about mentoring someone is ensuring that you get a a connection with them there's a clear connection between you and the mentee and that that's a that's a dynamic it's an interaction uh, it's a feeling of uh, a mutual understanding mutual respect and support and that's that's really very important to have a, a connection uh, and of course it's absolutely critical um, in that relationship to instill uh, confidence in the mentee that actually the subject that you're dealing with you have some expertise around that you're able to support the mentee through and so as well as having that connection it's important that you have that confidence again two ways but a confidence by the mentor and a confidence by the mentee uh, in in the process and in the uh, in the potential uh, outcome and perhaps more importantly than anything else dealing with mentees who are dealing with uh, difficult challenges as we all deal with on a daily basis uh, the issue comes up time and time again uh, in effective management leadership or in mentoring of compassion and the same applies when we're dealing with training healthcare professionals. You know, we're opening a new medical school, get a sort of opportunity to mention that. And we're talking about developing compassionate clinicians. And in many ways, a clinician, a doctor, or a nurse, a physician associate, a, a paramedic, uh, in many ways mentors that patient through that journey in terms of their, their recovery to, to health. And it has to, be, it has to be compassionate. So I would say, uh, conscious of time and uh, the fact that I do have a tendency to um, go on a bit, I'll go for the three C's of uh, communication and confidence uh, in the process and, uh, and compassion. Thank you very much. We'll definitely remember the three C's. Uh, now pass on to Ansh, who is going to ask a very important question as well. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ansh Teva. I'm your international student ambassador. I can see a lot of international students in attendance today. So thank you for attending. Before I ask the question, I would like to thank uh, our student union president, Victor, for organizing such a wonderful event and all the volunteers for taking out the time to put this together. Uh, my question is to Andy. And uh, during my time at Governors, you have been very kind and had the time to guide me and uh, explain me and go through things when I have been confused. So whilst everyone's journey is unique, what valuable lessons can you share to inspire young people, especially people like us who leave their home and come to a different university, to a different country, in terms of personal and professional growth? Uh, thanks, Hanj, and, and thanks everyone for uh, inviting me to sit up here today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my, my background. I, I was um, from Bolton College. I, I left school and went to Bolton College uh, as an engineer to uh, learn how to repair televisions. We don't repair televisions anymore. We just throw them away. But in the, back in the day, that was what I was doing. And I had a Saturday job, and that Saturday job was going around um, repairing televisions or taking them back to the workshop. And that's what I wanted to do as a career. But then I realized that, that people um, were always disappointed that you didn't come yesterday. They were always upset that the television's not been working and the kids have been uh, playing it up for the last two days. 
And I also worked for a boss who was a compulsive liar. So basically, he always used to say things like, oh, they couldn't come yesterday because uh, his grandma died and he had to go to the funeral. So I'd go to someone's house and they'd say, oh, really sorry to hear about your grandma. Um, and I'd say, what? What's, what's that? So, so the, these things taught me, that this is the first boss I had, and, and that taught me a valuable lesson. <clears throat> always work with integrity and you know in everything we do and I'll, I'll talk a little bit in a second about the the core values that we have as a business and integrity is one of them don't lie don't tell your customers something that, that's not true so that's the, that was the first thing I think we're all on a journey we're, we're on a journey in life and we're on a journey in, in our career and I think the next thing is to have a plan and that plan will change because things change and my, my company is a technology company and technology is just constantly changing in the in the 40 years that I've worked in technology, we've moved from analog to digital, from digital to IP, from IP to the, you know, the, the internet and, and, and all the things that, that are happening now. And we've had to change uh, as, as the company goes by. I, I want to have a, add one other boss, and that was the guy that I bought the business off because I did a management buyout 20 years ago. And that boss you could describe as a, um, a benevolent dictator. So he was kind and he looked after his people, but he, he would never work together and would never collaborate with, with the managers. He always used to want to divide and conquer. And that taught me a lesson, not to be like him, to, to be more collaborative. And everything I do, I try to be collaborative. I try to bring the team along with me. And I think what's important is to have that plan to bring the team along with you and to have good people around you. I've, I've experienced working in organizations where the chief exec employs people that are worst, uh, the worst people you could, you could employ because they want to look good. And if they employ people that are better than them, they, they might not look good. Um, so, but that never works because it all, you always get found out. So I, I, I find it's true that you should have a good team around you, have a team that's, that's really um, uh, works with you and you know, is up to the best, uh, of the, uh, works to the best of their ability. This is something I always tell to students, whether it be school students or uh, university students. Nobody can expect anybody to work more than what you're capable of and what your, your best of your ability is. And so that's what I'd, I'd ask people to do. And, and I think the thing that got me on in my career and how I progressed was putting yourself forward for things. You know, people, if you just sit there, people won't come and give you new roles or new opportunities. But if you go and ask, you know, I'm really interested in doing this, I'd like to get involved in that, I'd like to try and work on this new project, then that's how you progress your career. And that's something that I've found important over the years. So we're on a journey together, um, work to the best of your ability, put yourself forward for things and have a plan. I think those are the most important things that I would say uh, as we're moving forward in our careers. Thank you so much, panelists. Um, I would like to call on Charlotte. So, hello. Um, I've got a question for Professor Zubair. Um, quite an interesting one, if I'm honest with you. How would you describe the role of artificial intelligence in leadership now and in the future? Ah, oh, that's, uh, that's a million dollar question. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I think, I think one thing we, we have to accept, okay? So if you, if you look at our journey as species, you know, we, we not so long ago, we were effectively cave dwellers, uh, and then we moved to, you know, dwelling in caves, to the, uh, to the grassland, to explorers. We've gone through the, the, the paramount industrial revolution, We've had the IT revolution, so to speak, the information age. We've had the in internet revolution. And we are clearly now in the sort of the heartlands of artificial intelligence. Now, any leader who says now that artificial intelligence will not affect me, I think is mistaken. I really think is mistaken because what is coming now, and I, I think we, we've, we've gone through this, and um, you know, if, you, if you're old enough to remember in the 70s when we had the IT revolution, 
a lot of people were talking very much about the paperless office. The paperless office. And do you know what happened? We all brought printers <laughs> and we turned out reams and reams of paper. And it, it just didn't happen. Even today, we don't quite have the paperless office. We do have a lot of things, which is digital and so on, but there are still a lot of people who like paper. And I think that was a mistake then to say we're going to have a paperless office. But what's coming now is very, very different in the sense that, you see, I, I came from, I've got an industrial background. I was in industry and I used to code systems. Okay? I used to create programs. And the way you created a program when I used to do it, the first thing I had to do is solve the problem myself. So a simple example, if I wanted to find an area of, say, a circle, I had to understand how to find an area of a circle. And then what I had to do is code the computer to give it instructions to say, create a variable, take that variable from the user, what is, say, the radius of that circle, then do this calculation, then output the answer and display that and you've done your little code. And that's probably the simplest program you would do. But the, the syntax is very much, you have to solve the problem. You have to have the solution, and you are instructing the computer. Now, artificial intelligence is very, very different. It is machine learning, where if you solve the problem, you've defeated the objective. It is very much about creating the code that will self-learn. Don't solve the problem for the code, but say to the code, here are, here are some faces, but before you even give some faces to say, recognize a human face from say an animal face, you have to teach it to say, here's the difference between an edge and a surface. So you have to give it lots of data and you're not asking, you're not solving the problem for the computer, you're asking the computer to self-learn, okay? It's a very difficult concept and it's very, very different. Now with that, we are at a cusp and the computers are already doing that. If you looked at ChatGPT, I uh, recently, I had to produce a report and I spent some time and I used the, you know, my broken English in the report and so on and I produced a report which I thought, okay, I, I think I can be proud of this. It's a re, you know, reasonable report. Then I thought to myself, I'm going to just p push that report into G chat GPT. And I'm going to say to chat GPT, can you enhance this report? Use better English, do this. What came out of that was far, far better than I could achieve. I didn't submit that report because I felt it's not my work. But what I'm saying to you is, this is a machine, ChatGPT technically is not connected to the inter internet. It is a learning device. It has taken information, it's learned from the information, and it's produced something. Now, the leadership of the future will have to em embrace artificial intelligence. We will have to use that for our advantage. There's lots of doomsday stories about, you know, robots will take over and so on. I think there will be some safeguard in place. I think things will change. There's gonna be transformational changes, changes in all areas of society, including leadership. We will still need to work collaboratively. There will also be more demands for an escape from artificial intelligence as well. But I think at the end of the day, I, I see the future, what's left of it for me, I guess, Okay, I'm uh, a lot older than George. <laughs> What's left it, of it for me, I see the future as quite bright, really, in the sense that I think with AI, with machine learning, we can, we can broker a partnership. We can use the robots to help us. We can, we can do things which we find boring, which we find repetitive. Uh, but also, I think we can create new types of jobs as well. And I think, you know, we will... Uh, hopefully we'll have a better society, more learned society, more society that can understand one another as well. 
Uh, and I, I see that as the cross, cross of what artificial intelligence will take into leadership. And I think any leader, as I said, repeat again, any leader that ignores it, I think they will do it at their own peril because I think it is here and it is something we should all embrace. Thank you. Could, could I just add one thing? We, we, we have an artificial intelligence engine that we use in call centers. And I, I just wanted to tell you this because one of you students might be working for me one day. I've already got one Bolton alumni who works for us and we've got a, a knowledge transfer partnership that we're working uh, towards with the university uh, to pr bring in a master's student as well. And this, this, this engine, um, you feed it with telephone calls and we feed it, it was a Hungarian language uh, product, we've got the uh, UK exclusive on it, on it. You feed it with telephone calls, you, you feed it with 200,000 telephone calls and, and this engine has learnt English. It, it can now speak English, it can listen to English and, and it can transcribe it, it can, it can actually then measure things. So we have analysts who are writing scripts for this and um, we, we, we use it in the, in the call centers to, um, to enhance the sale, first of all. So if you say so certain words to a customer, they're more likely to buy from you than, it, than if you say other words. So we write the scripts and tell the agents what to say, and this engine checks that they're saying that, prompts them and tells them if they're not saying it. It works in compliance that if you're, if you're a, a bank and you, you don't say that this call is recorded, that call's not compliant, and that's the next PPI uh, disaster that's coming down the line. So it's quite a clever thing. But one of the spin-offs of it is being agent welfare. It will actually tell if, from the sentiment of the call whether the agent's being treated well or badly by the caller. So if someone's shouting at them, if someone's swearing at them, it can tell all those things. And if the, if the agent takes a really particularly bad call, it will then uh, send that uh, to the supervisor to say this guy needs a break. And we're now working with uh, a number of police forces who are listening to 999 calls, which are pretty tough calls. And they're uh, listening to those calls with this AI engine. Uh, and we've got uh, analysts now writing scripts for that. Um, one of the customers is the Welsh police and now we're having to teach this engine to speak Welsh, which is a little bit of a challenge because we couldn't find 200,000 999 calls in Welsh to actually feed it. So we're feeding it with YouTube videos. So this is real. This is something that's happening right now. It's something that's, you know, I've already got a, a Bolton graduate and I'm looking for another one working within our business to, to, uh, to work on this, uh, on this artificial intelligence engine. And it's very, very powerful. So I just wanted to mention that because one day one of you guys might be working for us. word from what you said, you said um, putting yourself forward. I remember coming up with this concept, um, both in leadership conference um, in my office, and um, I just reached out to the university, reached out to Janet, and I was like, this is what I want to do for the students, got in touch with some of the students, shared the ideas, and then I brought it to the university. And I must say, George, I'm really grateful for your support, and um, Zube, I thank you for this magnificent um, outing. Thank you so much, I'm really grateful. And on behalf of the students, let us just give a round of applause. From the planning down to this stage, and even this morning when I got some news and I was, um, <laughs> I was disappointed and destabilized, I just reached out to George immediately, and reached out to Zubair and Iris, and um, I was just so surprised. I just sat down. When the students came to me, they were like, why are you calm? I said, um, let me just stay calm. And I want to appreciate you for the way you made things turn out even excellently well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Putting yourself forward. I've, I've learned a lot of things these past days. And I'm grateful to my tutors for your support as well. And I'm grateful to the project team leaders. I would like to call on Janet. She is the general manager of the Student Union. She's the brain behind the Student Union doing all the hard work for the vote of thanks. Hi everybody, so you tend to ask me if I'd like to close with um, saying thanks, but I think he's just done my job for me, so um, I'll have another go anyway. Um, so I've got a few thank yous that I'd like to say. Um, firstly, um, to thank those that have helped to organise this, so that is you, Chenna, um, but with the support of Zubair and his team, 
Aris and his team, and obviously the Vice Chancellor, and all the student volunteers that have contributed today um, to make this such a successful um, event for students. Um, I'd like to thank the panellists because actually without them this event wouldn't be as it is and they have um, sorry they had the, their valuable interactions tonight they've the thoughts and the um, perspectives that they've shared with us they've challenged how we think our own perspectives and I think that's a really inspiring thing to do. Um, I'd like to thank all the attendants tonight, the students that have come out. I think giving your time to attend an event like this demonstrates your commitment to learning, which is what we're all here for, and your dedication to personal growth. Your um, participation and um, thoughtful questions have contributed to a great successful evening. And I think it's important to remember that events like this are not just about what happens during the evening. And, and I'm sure that the discussions that you've heard, the conversations that have taken place and the knowledge that you've acquired will continue to resonate long after this event's closed. I hope you take with you not only the knowledge and insights that you've gained, but also a renewed sense of purpose and a commitment to make positive impact in your respective fields and communities. The discussions and ideas shared have the potential to drive positive change and influence through great leadership. In closing, I'd just like to reiterate our thanks to the organisers, the panellists, the student volunteers, the moderators, and everybody that's attended. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you so much for that brilliant um, vote of thanks. Um, the Vice Chancellor has asked to say some few words, but before I let him come up here, I would like to make some few announcements. Um, courtesy of the university, we have um, a light buffet there for everyone. Um, we are going to do it in such an organized manner so that we don't get that place crowded. So Asma and Jemiga, please raise up your hand, Asma and Jemiga. Um, after the Vice Chancellor's speech, they will, direct us, um, they will direct us on how we'll go about that. And secondly, before we go for the buffet, we'll be having photograph. So the order will go in this manner. I'll repeat this again, but let me just say it now so you remember it when I say it again. We'll have every, all the panelists first, right in front here. The guest panelists, um, academic, um, our academic panel, and the moderators will have our pictures first. And after that, we'll have the guest panelists, all the panelists, and the project team um, yeah, go next. And the third one will be the panelists and all the students by my right hand side. That should be your left, right? After that, we'll have the panelists and all the students by my left hand side, which is your right, obviously. That will be, that's how the pictures will go in this order. May I invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor George Holmes, to take us um, this few, on his few words. Thank you. Well, well thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Mayor, it's, it's very um, important to the university that we have a close connection uh, with our town of Bolton. And uh, the mayor, uh, time and time again, supports this university as the first citizen of the town, the elected first citizen of the town. And so, can we all just thank the mayor for attending? Um, Obviously, the university's thanks go along with the student union's thanks to our, to our panellists, to, to our academic colleagues, uh, and more importantly, to our student president, to Yuchenna, because, of course, he's a very dynamic and very forward-looking president, and it's a, a delight to work with him uh, in his presidential year. So, thank you, Yuchenna. Um, two, two final words from me. One on chat, GPT, and AI. It's not quite as good yet as Professor Hanslot would, would have us, or indeed Dr. Roberts would have us, in that I decided I was actually uh, in the Middle East with, with Rayhan and a few colleagues, and the previous mayor actually, uh, we were in the Middle East um, at our campus out there, and they decided to put me into ChatGPT to get a little bit of a profile on me from ChatGPT. Now some of it was right, but it did say that I was 10 years older than I actually am, 
Yeah. Yes, it said I was 48. No, no, it actually did say that, that I was 10 years older than I actually am. Significantly, it was wrong. It actually said, this was the worrying thing for me, and we all looked at each other. It said that I'd retired three years ago. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? It's true, it's true. It's absolutely true. And, and the even more worrying thing, it said I'd got an OBE in 2012, and that never arrived, you know? So what happened? You know, what, what, what actually happened? Um, so it's not quite as reliable yet. Um, as it used to be. There appear to be a couple of Professor George Holmeses in the world that it's, it's, mixed up, it's mixed up together and so consequently don't always rely on it. My final comment would be you have made already one of the major steps in your continuous leadership journey by being here tonight. And I talked to my son Tim, he's at another university well up the road up in the, the north of England and I talked to Tim about what he should do for his life. He's talking about having an academic career like me ultimately and uh, he says to me, you know, what should I do, Dad? And I say, this is what you've done tonight. The number one rule in life, be there. Be there. If you're not in the room, you've, the opportunity will pass you by. And you've made the decision to be here. And that's massively important, both of our panelists and of our union and of our staff and our colleagues, but more importantly of you, our, our, our learners, our students, our graduates uh, of the future because your leadership journey will be much more effective if you are as you are tonight. You're there, be there, be in the room. Someone once said to me, the way to get success in life, you either are in the room or you know somebody who's currently in the room so you can make the connection with that person to make it happen. And in that sense, you've done it. You've not wasted any time at all tonight because you're here. Time is your most valuable possession. It's the only thing we can't buy more of. Even you know, the great leaders of the world, the great Bill Gateses, you know, the great T Steve Jobses, etc., could not buy more time back. But spending that time wisely by being there on your leadership jo journey is probably the biggest and most important development you'll ever take. So whenever you're offered the opportunity and you're thinking to yourself, I could have been at home tonight, I could have been watching Love Island, I could have been watching Coronation Street, I could have been sitting there having a cup of coffee or whatever it was you were doing. I could be talking to my friends. I could be walking my dog. Whatever it things you could have been doing, you've decided to make the right choice and be there to have a consideration of the issues that will affect uh, your future. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have a work-life balance, but I am saying if you remember nothing else in life, the reason I'm stood here today, be there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. May I ask the mayor to please step forward for the group photo? Professor George Holmes, Dr. Rehan Hazan. Yes, yes, for the photo. And all the Professor Zubai and the Janet, and all the panelists, please. Panelists and moderators, please step forward for the first um, set of photos.